Well, good afternoon, everyone. Today, we have a wonderful, interesting um, topic to talk to you about, the nine building blocks or the business model canvas. We have Doug Barber, who is an experienced uh, presenter and who knows the ins and outs of this BMC, and he's going to talk all about it. If you have any questions as we go along, you can either use the Q&A option or the chat, and we will be uh, looking at these at the end of our presentation. Just as a reminder, this is being taped, so you will get a link to the video, and you'll also get a copy of the slides in the presentation. So let's get started. Uh, Doug, could you just give me a click, and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, SCORE. SCORE is a nonprofit organization. We're a nationwide organization that's sponsored by the Small Business Administration. And we offer free, really free, confidential business mentoring and business educational services like this one. Our chapter, the Minnesota chapter, serving Manatee and Sarasota counties for over 50 years, has nearly 90 volunteers waiting to help you as mentors uh, to uh, get you started in your business or move forward in your business. Our chapter has recently been recognized as a national chapter of the year, and we are also a diamond chapter. Since its founding in 64, we've helped over 11 million people. Now, we help you in all phases of your business, not just the startups and in the research and planning. That's certainly one thing that we do a lot. But we also, once you're open, we'll help you beyond that. We'll help you grow your business. And lastly, if you're thinking about selling or closing your business, firstly, you need to come next week where our presentation is all about selling or closing or buying a business. But we help in that exit strategy too. We'd like to thank our sponsors and community partners because they help us keep the lights on. There are expenses and someone has to pay for it. We thank them very much. If you have an opportunity to uh, use any of these partners, please thank them for their support. We also have relationships with some of these banks. And if you're looking for a loan, we may be able to assist you. So without further ado, Let's talk about the nine foundations to your business model canvas. Doug, uh, welcome. I wonder, you, if you, I wonder if you could give us, a, and I wonder if you could uh, turn your uh, video on, or is this young man going to be talking to us today? <laughs> That's the uh, challenge here. Uh, when I uh, start playing with my video, uh, Oh, there it is, the button right there. There we go. Unable to start the video. Okay. So not going to see me. You know what? Just share your screen again, and we're good to go. We'll be looking at this young man today. As soon as you get me off beat here, <laughs> it wasn't part of the scrap. Sorry, uh, you're right. So tell, tell us a little bit about your background, Doug. Well, that's a picture of my grandson, and so he's my fellow diver. A little bit of my background, I'm a builder. Residential, light commercial, Western New York, uh, very small business. It started uh, from basically remodeling. Uh, we did occasional flipping of projects, buy some rundown buildings, uh, fix them up, flip them. Or as a builder, you also had the inside with the real estate people. So we ended up remodeling and holding those to make rentals for ourselves. So we ended up uh, holding and operating about a dozen rentals for 20 years. We also got our hand in land development. As a builder, you need to build on something. Uh, so we ended up with a little land development, taking some parcels and subdividing them out. Uh, then after that career, I moved into technical education, uh, earned the required degrees and stayed in that technical education for about 20 years. Finally, I did retire, uh, or I say graduated from work there, and I retired and end up owner operator of rentals and property in Belize, uh, where we still have a footprint. I also managed our family LLC property and um, currently selling out of Belize, moving out. Uh, it's time to uh, 
graduate from work and and what I end up doing, working for SCORE, uh, which is a <laughs> phenomenal opportunity to work with SCORE and the clients that we get at SCORE, hardworking clients that do an excellent job of promoting their business. And Wonderful. 13 Good years. Good for you. All right. Well, let's get started with our BMC. Take it away. Well, what is the BMC? And you'll hear it phrased differently. You'll see different titles on it. If you go in to research it on the internet, you'll see that there are various uh, models and plans. But this is the one that was basically started about 20 years ago in Europe. And the concept is to be able to put your business on a one page summary, easy to handle. It is a tactical tool. It is a brainstorming, it's a dynamic tool. So just because you start putting something on your paper, as you start to research the various components, you need to change it. It's dynamic. Put a date on it, save it, start working on the next version of it. You're going to move along. A business plan is a detailed operating plan. Business plans are required when you go to a bank. If you're looking for a loan from the bank, you're probably going to have to come up with two or three years of IRS uh, your tax filings, your tax filings to the IRS, and a detailed business plan. The bank wants to know how you're going to pay them back. They want to know everything about your business. This is not what a BMC is. The BMC can help set your framework for a detailed business plan, but it only sets the framework. So it's constantly moving until you finally get to the point where you say, all right, move forwards with it. Been using it here successfully for about 10 years. Um, and it's, it's, it steers your conversation. So many people, when they start moving into a new business, they just don't know where to start. And what I like about the BMC, when we get somebody that literally has a blank canvas, just an idea for a business, it directs our conversation. That's what I'm looking for. So we don't spend a lot of time we can BS and we can have coffee over the internet here, but no, let's get down to where we focus on what we're doing. So that's what we're going to do with our BMC. The BMC applies just as that ladder that I showed you that ladder to a new business. That's where I'm usually brought in on the new business, uh, typically an operating business, not a retail business, more of a service business. That's typically what I participate in with SCORE evaluating and improving existing businesses. And again, we looked at that ladder that Diane had in hers, and that's where we are, because every successful business is gonna have all of these components. And you can summarize it very nicely on the BMC. Or buying or selling an existing business. Again, these nine components are gonna be what people are gonna look at when buying and selling. And as you, next week when they do the exit strategy, and I participated with the exit strategy, these nine become, components become very, very important. Know what they are, so you know how to position yourself to buy or to sell your business. Uh, it also works for profits and nonprofits. You'll see BMC also for nonprofits. Eh, slightly different boxes, but it's essentially the same. Business model canvas. Here we are. Let me just get rid of those guys there. Make my screen a little larger. Here we are, the nine boxes. I've colored the right-hand boxes here, uh, the value proposition. Number box number one, that's what we're going to concentrate on. Then number two, the customer segments. Once we get those nailed down, we can start talking about channels and finally customer relations. The left-hand side and the lower portion, the left-hand side is going to be proper, is going to be mostly operations and we'll briefly cover these. And lastly, the revenue streams. There is no way we have enough time to be able to go through and study all of, all of these in detail. I will repeatedly say, work with your partner or your SCORE mentor. If you have a business partner, fabulous. You've got somebody to talk to. If you don't, work with your SCORE mentor. SCORE mentor, easy to get a hold of. SCORE.org, simple as that. SCORE.org brings you to the national website, put in your zip code, 
and then it's going to ask you for your information, including a description of what you're going to want to do with your SCORE mentor. So depending where you are, are you a startup or you're an existing business? These, this information is very important to get you the appropriate uh, mentor. So our case assigner looks at this information, then tries to fit a mentor with your needs. Close as possible. We don't have every single one. So we just try to get close as possible. This will steer the conversation. Value proposition. What am I doing here? Oh, it's over there. There we go. This is, uh, will be available along with the PowerPoint. So you don't have to worry about taking notes. All of this is going to be available. The value proposition is what value do we offer to our customer? And we're going to work on this. We're going to work. The majority of our time is going to be over here on the right-hand side. From the value proposition to the customer segments, who is our customer? How can we slice and dice our customer into various geographic demographic portions to know how we're going to address them. And lastly, not lastly, a third box is channels. We know what we want to sell. We know who we want to sell it to. How are we going to get there? Two types of channels. One is going to be the marketing, the communications channel, and the second could be the delivery channel. Over on the left side, Key partners, key activities, key resources. Again, very operational. We'll touch on these, but we don't have the time to cover all the components. Working with your SCORE mentor, you can fill these out. Don't try to fill the whole business model canvas out at once. It's a progression. Box number one, box number two, box number three. Down below, we've got our cost structure. What are our costs? What type of costs do we have? What are our costs and our revenue streams? How are we going to make money? How are we going to bring money in? So those are the, the three major segments. The right-hand side has to do with the value proposition and the product. The left-hand side is an operational side. And down below, we've got revenue streams. It's going to steer our conversation. One of the first steps we do is we ask people to conduct a SWOT analysis, S-W-O-T, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, it really is, is a very good starting place to organize what you know and what you don't know. And using the internet to pound around a little bit and explore your subject, you'll be able to fill out your strengths, weaknesses, Threats, who's your competition? I have a client right now. They have a wonderful idea, strong, good list of strengths, weaknesses. Didn't see a lot. You know, we got a couple there. We got questions as uh, we had a couple mentors on it. So we bring up those questions, looking at their SWOT analysis. And finally, their threats. Who are your competitors? They never researched to see who their competitors were. That was an eye-opening experience. So those are your threats. They're going to be there. Uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Let's just work on the strengths because the strengths, we're going to take those key words and we're going to use those words, those strong words that you're going to build. Brainstorm. When you brainstorm, you never throw anything out. Just keep on jotting down sentence statements, not paragraphs, sentence statements. You're going to end up with a large list of strengths. Again, we haven't cut anything out, true brainstorming. We never say no, leave everything there. But then we can start to sort that out and prioritize it. What are our strongest words? What are our strongest words that say who we are? What we do? Why we're different and better? This is important on the marketing side. And your strength words, again, never throw them out. You'll be able to use those words in the future as you work on your marketing material. They're all good words. They just may not be the hottest words that you want right up front. Working on that value proposition again. We want these key words right there in our, our value proposition. That's where we're concentrating our effort. Working with new clients, new business concepts. This is the 
the key one, two, one, two. Let's go back and forth. It's dynamic. Keep on revising it. Save the old ones under a date. Pull it up and modify it and then go back and then uh, work on the next. You may find in your research on customer segments, it's going to affect your value proposition. So that's why I say it's dynamic. Keep on working on it. In the value proposition, introduce your prospective buyers and you wanna be able to make a really strong impression. And you're not always gonna be able to do that with eye contact and to sell yourself because it's gonna be your marketing pieces that are going to be your face to the prospective buyers. You need the value proposition to describe how your product services improves the customer's problem, solves the problems, offers them something. It explains also why they should buy from you, why you are the best. Value proposition is what's on the BMC, but it's also known as the unique selling proposition. That's what's going to differentiate you. If you think about that, it's what's important. Yes, that's the value proposition, but the unique selling proposition talks to me more directly about what it is your business is going to do. What makes it unique? Craft a simple and concise explanation. And this is wordsmithing and it's tough. It's tough because we all want to run on about how great our business is. Think of the elevator pitch. You get on the elevator on the first floor, you see the uh, guy next to you punch the third floor and you say, oh, I got three floors in which to introduce myself. So you start in, you got three floors, 30 seconds, 45 seconds. You need to hit them straight forwards with who you are, what you do, why you're different. In this case, in this example, I wanted to use Square. That's the little gizmo that plugs into your phone and you can swipe your credit card on it. It's about 15 years old. It's still for this example, it, it's excellent. You can go on the internet and if you wanna know what the BMC for Apple, you can find one for Apple, you find one from GMC. They're pretty vague because they're so large, but a lot of businesses have been working with the BMC and they use that to communicate to their staff and their, their, their employees who they are and what they're doing. Nice and concise. Square, the purpose of Square, and if you haven't seen one, you've always, you've seen all these gadgets you slice. What they did is it creates accessibility for credit. Something bothers me when I see somebody walk away with my credit card in a store or walk away in the restaurant. I don't see it for five minutes. And I ask myself, mm. Well, what are they buying? Uh, I did a lot of travel for a while, going down to Belize. I found out that if I swiped in Miami, that within four to six months, my card was stolen. I didn't steal it right away. So I started using cash only um, because they would take the card and double swipe it uh, or it would disappear for a few minutes. Not easy to do. So I really like the square idea of being able to swipe. Their customer segmentation, the process of dividing customers into groups on common characteristics so companies can market to each segment. That can be a bit of a challenge. It's easy to say, but tough sometimes to prove what are your segments. It allows for the best selection of a communication channel for each one of these segments. You're gonna slice and dice the segments, geographic, demographic, depends on your product, who you're trying to communicate with. Working with the company right now, they're gonna be regional based. It's gonna be a regional based company. No sense in trying to look countrywide, but region, state, and city. That's what they're looking at right now. Might be you're gonna be a service business and you're gonna be in Sarasota, Manatee counties or just Manatee County. Again, slice it down to where it's gonna be manageable for you and market to that area. 
demographics, age, gender, occupation, income. A lot of this stuff is available. You'll be amazed at what is available. Who are the Square customers? Hey, they're small businesses. They targeted small business. How many? 27 million in the United States. Right here in Florida, I think most of them are right here and they're all driving vans and pulling trailers. It's a ton of small businesses, mom power restaurants, small businesses. Individual owners could be smaller outlets, smaller shops, could be that kiosk in the mall. You know, they don't have any internet connection other than through their phone. Uh, then you can slice and dice in terms of the verticals, fashion, sports, recreation. How are you going to go after them? Their value proposition, let's look at it again. Square creates accessibility for credit transactions, low price per transaction, convenience, customization of reports, risk reduction. It's easy to use. Boom. They hit it all in a nice, succinct value proposition. It also leaves you with the question, what I like about a value proposition, when you introduce yourself to somebody, you've got a value proposition, it, it opens it up. Really, how easy is it to use? What, what are some of the questions that might be popping up once you hear this from somebody or you read it and you say, how easy is it to use? One of the things that they did to promote Square is they sent it boxes of 10 or 12 to every score office small businesses let's get it out to the counselors so they can see this since square was put on the market there are now dozens of products that are run similar they also have increased their product line and the customization of reports uh so that's it's a lot bigger product than they used to start with Communications and logistical. Two ways, two channels to reach the customers. An example of the communications, the marketing I think is pretty straightforward. How are you gonna make your products and service available? How are you gonna foster a relationship with the customer? Not everybody buys in six nanoseconds. They wanna come back, they wanna do some research. Let's look at the reviews. Let's look at the sizes again. Let's look at how they fit. Uh, so it's, it's, you develop a relationship by coming back again and again. And if you've bought anything on the internet, you may have found that once they've got your email address, they're back at you again, asking questions. If you haven't bought, they remind you that you've been on the website. Um, you know, would you like to follow through? If you put something in your cart and you didn't close out, boy, that's come back to haunt me. Hey, you got two things in your cart. Would you like to close it out? All we need is your credit card number. Communications, marketing, build that relationship with the customer. Down the lower right-hand corner now, you see the little chats pop up. That's building the relationship. I'm not a big fan of chats because I've got fat fingers and I'm a slow typer. So I'd rather talk to somebody on the phone. A lot of places give you that option. You want to chat? you want to talk to a human being boom there i am talking to the human being excellent excellent logistical think of flowers out here on 64 we've got a number of greenhouses uh yes you can buy retail you can go there pick it up buy it retail uh but they also sell wholesale so they have their products packed up on these large rolling uh trays and, and shelves and you, you see a tractor trailer pull up to home depot or lowe's and out they pull all the flowers that were just right down the street on 64 but now it's convenience because you're right there at the big box store you can buy exactly the same thing but how are you going to deliver that if lowe's is your customer or you're going to go through a wholesaler to a retailer to the customer uh, that's part of what you have to look at how are you going to deliver your service those two, two types of channels to reach your customers. Two words that get mixed up here, marketing research and marketing. 
The market research has to do with the who, where, develop customer profile. It has to do with digging in and getting into the internet, getting into databases. Uh, you want to slice it into customer segments. So when you slice it up into customer segments, and one of the tools that I've used with a couple of customers is the United States Post Office advertisement coming forwards has something called every door, every door delivery. You can actually have them deliver a pre-printed card, folder, envelope to every door on a specific route in a specific zip code. Why? Because it's target marketing to a particular uh, geographic area. Might be it's an older home that needs a roof. So if it's 25 years or 20 years older, they're gonna be looking for a roof. Let's slice and dice and look at that population. Within every door marketing, you can go in there and you can look at average salaries, uh, values of homes, ages of homes. They give you that information within every door. That's a U USPS marketing tool. Why they do all that? Because they want you to use the US mail so they can increase and they can sell you more stamps, sell you the service. Marketing is that part where now you're gonna communicate. You figured out the who and the where, now you're gonna figure out how. How you're gonna communicate, how you're gonna deliver your message. What is the best medium? Working with a couple of my clients that have really done a masterful job looking at delivering the message. Got a remodeling business. What's the best way to communicate? There are a lot of remodeling businesses. Do we wanna use the East County Observer, which has got certain geographic areas? Do we wanna use the Trib? Do we wanna use newspapers? Do we wanna use those glossy magazines? AKA marketing pieces we get in the, mail, in the mail. Do we want individual cards? How do we target the who and the where? And now what are we gonna tell them? What are we going to create? So what's the best way to communicate to our customer and what is the best medium to use to reach the customer segment? Library resources are phenomenal. They're free and it's current. Uh, your, your reference librarian, whether it be Sarasota or Manatee, those are the two that I'm most familiar with. Phenomenal reference librarians. They have got access to a data bank, it's a program that you can use for free if you are a member of the library. So first you need a library card, then it's best to work with the reference librarian to find out how to get in and dig that data out. Customer information, zip codes, demographic information, consumer data, excellent, excellent. I love this next one, competition. Let's check on our competition, the size of the business. What can we find out? If the competition is big enough and literally has roots in the community, you might be able to dig out some information on your competition. It's important to know who your competition is. Also sample business plans and research trends in the industries available. It's free. Obtain a library card, contact your reference librarian. That fourth box on the right-hand side was customer relationships. Customer relations describes the way a company will engage with its customers to improve the experience. Boy, I got a couple that are just, I'm an Apple guy. I use Apple computers because I am not technical. I use the email, I use the program, but in terms of knowing how it works and the jargon that computer tech people have, not the case. Um, I use Apple support services when I need to integrate my phone, with my calendar, uh, I use support services. Strong customer relations lead to loyal clients. Positive word of mouth. Boy, I had an experience with Home Depot and I'll share with you is Home Depot. You all have experiences hopefully that will mirror this. We needed a new microwave. 
get on the internet last September. Little did I know that microwave parts were impossible to find. Therefore, microwaves weren't being built. So there weren't a lot out there. Last place I'd ever look would be Home Depot, but that's what came up on my internet search. The wife wanted a Whirlpool black. That's what they had. Great. I ordered it. Boom. It appears on a, on a uh, Thursday. My neighbor came over. We ripped into the package. It was all set to put up, pull the old one down, put the new one up. Whoa, man, this was slick. Wife comes in and goes, that's nice, but that's not what we ordered. I said, what? She says, I ordered black, stainless steel, and that's not the model. I said, oh, my goodness. If we go out and look at the carton, we ripped into the carton so fast, we never saw that somebody else's name was on it. We dropped it off. We looked at it to make sure it wasn't dinged or dented and pulled it, the microwave out. Everything was fine. Uh, it was, wasn't ours. Called Home Depot. It was Saturday at noon. Got an assistant manager. She said, Mr. Barber, let me look into this. I'll get back to you Monday by noon. Monday by noon, she was back to me. Mr. Barber, we've taken care of it. Uh, you'll have a new one by Thursday and we will bring it in and we will install it. We'll take the old one out and install the new one. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Customer service. Yes, I'm telling you about it because it's a positive word of mouth. You all have stories where you've had successful relationships with vendors. And those are the ones which sometimes are a little reluctant to relate to positive. People are more interested in getting on Yelp and talking and complaining than sometimes putting forward the positive word of mouth. But that's, that just wasn't what I expected out of Home Depot. Was not at all. Excellent. Excellent. And I tell people about it when they're looking for appliances, I wouldn't hesitate. Right hand side, value proposition. This isn't gonna come all about in one hour sitting down it's going to steer our conversation. Our conversation is going to work on the value proposition, those strengths that are so strong that are craft, that unique selling proposition. Once we start to nail that down, we can also be talking at customer segments at the same time. Now we get the customer segments and we start to get out to research those customer segments. Who are they? Where are they? What are the de demographics? What are the geographics? that match up with our value proposition. That's gonna require some research. Ooh, that first population that we talked about in our value proposition, eh, it's not gonna work. So we better start modifying some of our key words on our value proposition, make that unique selling proposition so it fits and our customer segments are gonna to link together, fit together. We get those two parts together don't rush this. I have people that jump out and go, I got a web page. You don't have a value proposition. What's your web page say? Oh, I got it all set up. I went to, you fill in the blank, one of these services. And uh, for $250, I bought a web page with a template. <laughs> it may not be. Let's just wait here. Let's wait until we get our value proposition, our customer segments. We get this nailed down so that we can then talk about what's the most appropriate channel and what goes in that channel. So it's the who and then the what, the marketing segment of that. Customer relationships is just ongoing. Think about how you're gonna treat those customers to make them repeat customers. The car company, the car company I bought my car from, they're there, I've had good relations with them and they are there reminding me regularly that they would like me to buy a new car, or even they want to buy my old car now, uh, they want to trade in. That's the right-hand side. Now we're going over to the left-hand side, and I'm sorry to rush this, but we are limited on time. I am available for an unlimited time when this initial segment is over, the 50-minute segment is over. Uh, I am available to answer any questions, and uh, one of the people that will help you move through creating this BMC is a SCORE mentor. And I'm repeating myself, SCORE.org, your zip code, your information, and a description of your business, what it is you want to achieve in contacting SCORE. Key activities. We're on the left-hand side. Key activities. 
what is it that you're going to perform in-house? And, and again, I, I got to work where I'm familiar, so that's going to be some contractor operations. Um, what are you going to perform outsource, and when are you going to self-perform? How big are you? Hey, if there's just one of you, then you better be prepared to outsource something. Where is it you're going to make your money? Are you going to make your money by sitting down and creating a website from scratch, learning WordPress, WordPress, wording, uh, learning all the ins and outs of building a website, construction, and then operation? I was naive when I had my websites built. I thought I wanted passive ones. I wanted basically an anchor that people would go and find out about Construction Services Inc. That was the name of our business. Little did I know that the platforms that it on are dynamic and they change over time. There are hackers out there that get in and disrupt it. I needed someone that was going to monitor the operation of my website, build it and monitor it. SEO, search engine optimization. It's a whole subcategory. How do I make my website so that it's at top of the Google list? Search engine optimization. Optimization. It takes skill and time to build that. Subcontract it. I'm working with a, a gentleman right now and uh, custom woodwork. Complicated. It has to do with boats. Custom woodwork on boats. He is operations and production. It's his hand that crafts the product. He is in charge of cost control. The challenging part is he's so busy being the operations and he needs to bill about 30 billable hours a week. That only leaves one day a week where he is the sales and marketing. So we're working on saying, how can we make this more efficient on the sales and marketing? Right now, he's working with a, a lot of boat yards, um, and putting out where he knows there's work being done on boats to make himself known and available. Website operation, he doesn't touch it. He has that subcontracted out. New product service development, he's it. That's it right there. Some things you're going to self-perform, some things you're going to outsource. It just makes so much sense. Another client. He insists on doing his own bookkeeping. I said, why are you doing bookkeeping? You can hire a bookkeeper and you can focus on more billable hours. Key resources, another block. Physical buildings and equipment. Hey, when I was uh, building, uh, started out as, as a, a contractor, I had a truck, a red truck. And all my equipment was in the red truck. That's all. I had no buildings to start. That was the physical portion of it. As we built over time, then we needed a storage building. Then we needed a shop. So that had us acquiring more space that we rented from people. Uh, and one, one was bought out. Financial, key resources. Boy, does everybody come with deep pockets when they start business? No. We end up with some type of relationship for investment and a line of credit. Initially, the investment portion of it, if you're starting with absolute zero, it's really, really tough. Uh, you're going to end up with friends and family, your savings. Uh, banks are really not interested in so you, you can show them a track record. Very difficult. The line of credit, financial, when I am working a small business, it's nice to be able to go to a bank, show them some tax returns and say, look, I need a line of credit. Because of the ups and downs of your revenues and your expenditures, you want to level that out using a line of credit. So I go to the bank, pull some money out, pay some bills. Over time, I pay that line of credit down. Financial, key resource. You also have intellectual property, patents, trademarks, trade secrets. Uh, what comes to mind is growing up in Western New York, corning, corning glass. They made more money off patents and trademarks than they did their production on some years because they had a lock on it, on glass. Technology as a key resource, human resources, who you have working for you. And right now that's really become critical as we start to look at why people aren't returning to work and where they're going back to work. 
And it's not just dollars, is it? They're not looking for just dollars. They're looking for a place that they're going to fit in, someplace they can contribute. Uh, those are our key resource block. Key partners, three types of key partners. You've got your vendors, which are very good. If you have a vendor that's selling, let's say, a floor finishing, they'll come in and actually do a demonstration and train your employees. Um, marketing support. You'll see on the outside of some of the vans, you'll see an actual product name. It's Joe's Carpentry, but he's using a certain lumber yard or he's using a certain product. They've paid to put that on the outside of the van. Credit terms, very important for your cash flow. What are the credit terms for the vendors? Once upon a time, I'm looking back, say when I was a builder, used to be net 30 days. Net 30 days. Then it uh, tightened up. It was net in 15. And now it's like net in 10. Um, because people have found that the cash flow is very important. They can't just sit on the money. So that's important in terms of what credit terms. When you go and you buy at Home Depot and Lowe's, you put it on a credit card. You're looking at credit terms, aren't you? They're looking for their money rate right up front. They got a huge amount of inventory. They got to turn it over. They need to collect the money so they can buy more inventory. Just in time inventory. Whoa, just in time inventory. That's one of the things that's causing a bit of a problem right now in this so-called supply chain problem we have. Everybody moved to just in time inventory. We just had enough on the shelf to take care of our projected immediate needs, whether one week or two weeks whatever that turnaround time was, a month. Well, that's fine. And if you had something you expected to come off from offshore within a month, well, it's sitting out there outside of Port of Los Angeles on one of those container ships. And it could be months before you see that come in. Has people rethinking just-in-time inventory, whether they're gonna outsource vendors out of the country or inside the country? What's going to give them that true, just-in-time, safe inventory? Strategic partners. Partnerships. And I like the example. Pet stores with veterinarians, groomers, boarding kennels, nutritionists, all available, all advertising each other. They don't compete. They support each other. Alliance between competitors. The last mile delivery. UPS, FedEx, and, and uh, USPS, I never realized that they have what's called last mile delivery. And when they accept the package, they have an agreement with the other three who is going to do the final de delivery, where it's going to go. So I may order something, and I think it's coming through from FedEx only to have USPS deliver it, the post office. It's called last mile delivery agreements. It's a win-win situation for all three. And you're never quite sure who's going to actually drop off the package. Joint ventures, a source of capital, but more importantly, also a source of risk. So if you're going to go out and look at these big highway products, remember I'm a construction guy, look at the amount of money that's tied up for years. Look at the expertise. If I'm going to do a chunk of highway, State, state Route uh, 70, and I-74, look at the amount of work that had to be done in bridge building, retainment walls, paving, preparation. There's a lot of risk that's going on and those additional skills. For one company to have all those skills, no, let's pull several companies together and bid this together. I'm a bridge builder. I'm a retaining wall guy. I'm an asphalt guy. I do uh, base and asphalt. And I'm the guy who shapes the road itself. So you have four people joining in on the joint venture, sharing capital, sharing the risks. Um, this is so important. Your support network. One of the early questions I ask people is, do you, who's your support network? Do you have somebody to talk to? Do you have somebody to work with? Uh, family and friends become very important. Is your significant other going to be supporting you? 
Is your, you know, who's your partner? Do you have a partner? Is this totally go it alone? Family, friends, nada. You're just gonna handle this alone. You don't really have any support network. It's great when you have a support network that's gonna give you the positive vibes, give you some ideas, work with you. I found my next most important was my accountant. I did, we did our own bookkeeping. My wife was a banker, worked in the bank, and we used a simple program and we did our own bookkeeping. But it was an accountant that did my taxes. It was the accountant I went to and I said, if I buy this truck, do I buy it? Do I lease it? Where do I go with this? Look at our financial situation. He'll back up to 30,000 feet and give you some opinions. Accountants can be very important. I got into land development. The accountant goes, you need to be a C-Corp. C-Corp? I'm not that big. I don't need to be a C-Corp. And he goes, hey, for the cost of becoming a C-Corp, there are tax advantages for you and your family as members of the C-Corp. Okay. Banker, lender, know your banker. And it's tough in today's environment when you literally have to make an appointment to see your banker, but you should have a relationship. You want to save, checking account, um, wire transfers, all through the same bank. So they get to see the manager at different points and they get to know who you are. Go in and even introduce yourself as a small business person. Find out what they have for funds that are available for small business, how they might help you. They're very interested. You saw several banks listed as supporters. They're interested in working with small businesses. No, they're not gonna write blank checks. They're gonna wanna know who you are and what they're doing. Insurance broker, once you start up with a small business, you wanna make sure your assets are covered, your back is covered. Insurance brokers become an important player in that. And lastly, the score mentor. Revenue streams, transaction streams, Transaction, ka-ching, that's the supermarket. Ka-ching, anytime you hear a register go off, that's a transactional sale. But what has Microsoft figured out? Subscriptions are better than one-time sales, right? Office 365, every year I'm being nicked for another 70 bucks for a full office. I don't even use the full office. Why can't they just sell me a partial one? Nope, I gotta buy the full office subscription. Membership, think of the gym. One, mem one gym takes it right out of your checkbook. Reoccurring sales. You have nothing to say, boom, they've got your checkbook number, boom, the fee comes in every month, bam. Usage fees, I never thought about UPS as a usage fee. Well, yeah, I'm using their equipment to deliver my package. USPS, I'm using that whole system to deliver my mail. Reoccurring sales. Lend leasing payments over time. That's how money's gonna flow into your business. And you think about that and how you can set it up. Cost structure, got two here, fixed costs and variable costs. Again, I'll talk about the cabinet shop guy, or you could talk about the retail sales. I wanna sell goods retail. What do you need? First, you gotta rent a building. First month's last month, you gotta put your money down, you gotta rent the building, boom. Then you gotta buy shelving. Do you have to do anything on flooring? Do you have to do any lighting fixtures? You have to bring all of the infrastructure into place. That's a fixed cost. If you, before you sell anything and if you sell nothing, you've got those fixed costs. Variable costs. That deals with the level of goods and services. For the cabinet shop, fixed costs. That's the building, that's the saws, that's the equipment, that's the lights on. Before you crank out your first cabinet, you've got fixed cost. If you do no cabinet work, you still have that cost. Variable cost. Now we're building cabinets. Bring the wood in, bring the varnish in, bring the employees in, bring more employees in. These are variable costs. We have experts that'll help you forecast your costs. We've got guys within SCORE, and that's their expertise, developing what's called a pro forma, pro forma. Cost-driven. Minimizing investment in the business and Southwest Airlines is by far the best example of Southwest. It's sneaking up on them a little bit. You know, they only lost 2000 flights last month. Uh, why? Because they've got an obsolete computer system. They're not running up the par. They're trying to figure out what their problem is. Cost-driven, 
Minimize your investment into the business. Cut the frills, review your key resources, your key activities, squish it down, but don't squish it so hard that it affects the quality. Value-driven, focused on providing maximum value, and that's Apple all the way. People pay ridiculous prices for an Apple phone. Absolutely. And now we've got all the major competitors getting right up there. It's a thousand bucks for a good phone. Apple wised up a little bit and they started to come up with the smaller phones with a smaller price tag and the same thing with their iPads. So they're meeting that market at a lower level. The price point is a lot less, but value driven. I buy into Apple because of the support, whether I get that at the store or I get that online, uh, I get it through their, their uh, internet intervention. So it's all there. Here we are coming back to our home base here. Value proposition, the right-hand side, that's where we're gonna focus the majority of our time. Then we can be filling out as we think about that, our key activities, our key resources, our key partners, finally, our costs and revenue streams. Thank you. We're doing for q and I'm probably a couple minutes over. I that's okay. Me. That's okay, actually. Uh, I do have a hand raised, but I don't see a cue or a, um, a chat. So while we're uh, figuring out whether uh, Ross has a question, uh, I want to thank you all for coming. And you will be getting a survey at the end of the webinar. It will be coming probably tomorrow or the next day. <clears throat> we really would like you to spend a moment and fill in that survey, if you could, please. Uh, tell us... Uh, Tell us what, how we can improve this. And more importantly, what other topics should we cover? We're always asking you this and, and we want to react to the suggestions that you have. Uh, please think about referring Minnesota SCORE to anybody who might benefit from our programs. And if you would like to volunteer with SCORE, just again, um, as Doug has said, go to score.org and click on the volunteer and tell us a little bit about yourself and you can reach out and help others. Um, Doug, could you click once, <clears throat> if you would, please? <clears throat> Uh, this is what our Minnesota SCORE website looks like. If you want to volunteer, there's a click on that. If you would like uh, a mentor, you can apply for a mentor. You can check out our other workshops. In fact, next week, we're going to be talking about buying or selling a business. And when you do your uh, BMC, you may say, you know, this seems like a lot of work. I wonder if it's possible to buy a business that has maybe 80% of the things that I'm looking for. So think about signing up for that. Actually, as uh, since this is a part of a series, you will uh, automatically get an invitation to that. You can search for podcasts and, and business scorecard articles. You can look for templates in our resource library. One more click, uh, Doug, and we are at the end. Um, so please respond to our webinar uh, survey evaluation, and uh, you'll be getting this video as well as the slideshow itself. And I think we have absolutely no questions. Uh, Ross, uh, I like this tool, BMC. Look forward to the copy of the slides. Just curious, what types of business are seeking your assistance lately? Just want to understand current trends and current issues. Uh, from my point of view, what kind of businesses are, uh, are coming to score? All kinds of businesses. Whatever you can uh, imagine, somebody is thinking about starting it. Doug, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I agree. The cross-section is, is phenomenal. That's why it's important when you request support from a mentor that you fill out a little information where it's a description. Talk about what type of support you're looking for, what type of a business you're interested in creating. Uh, that will help the case assigner assign that to a mentor. Uh, and the mentor then is your primary mentor who will then work with you and other mentors to bring in to try to solve uh to support your needs solve your problems support your needs that's a very good point doug um 
somebody, uh, Kathleen, has been working on her BMC for a few months, and she has a SCORE mentor. And your presentation today was a fantastic support. Thank you, Doug. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, Kathleen. And thank you, Brad, for your kind thoughts as well. So I think we have done it, Doug. What do you think? We're in, we're in very good shape. We covered a lot of material, uh, but it can be broken into small parts and digestible. Wonderful. Please consider applying for a SCORE mentor or to be a SCORE mentor. You may not know about the BMC, but you may know a niche and you could be what we call a subject matter expert where you help on just marketing or, or just accounting, one aspect of it, and that would be a big help. So thank you, Doug, and we look forward to seeing you again. Okay. Uh, Joseph just had a Q&A that popped up. Yep. End of the formal program, but if Joseph is there, uh, virtual business uh, options. Um, I'm currently working with a client that's going to have virtual business. Uh, it's got some huge challenges in terms of how they're going to sell it and how they're going to do that customer relationship when you are virtual. But yes, we have people that do score mentors that work with virtual businesses. Good, good answer. All right, thank you again for attending and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thanks again, Doug. Very good, thank you. Bye-bye.